Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Hanging Out for a Living, where we explore the power of friendship-based business relationships and the transformative impact they can really have on our professional lives. Today, I'm really thrilled to introduce you to a special guest, John Adams. John is a seasoned business consultant with a rather impressive background in the restaurant and pizza industry. So for 17 years, John played a pivotal role in business development for none other than Domino's Pizza. He is not only an entrepreneur, but also the host of The John Adams Show, a popular radio program. John's expertise lies in consulting for operators in the restaurant and pizza sectors, helping them enhance their team's readiness, optimize business processes, processes, I hope I said that right, and identify opportunities for growth and cost reduction. His, his mission is to elevate leadership abilities within teams, leading to better financial outcomes for investors, and of course, happier, more engaged employees. Welcome to Hanging Out for a Living, John. So thank you for having me on. Well, let's dive into our questions here. So John, you've had a fascinating journey with Domino's Pizza, and now as a business consultant, can you share a bit about how your experiences with Domino's shaped your approach to business consulting? I sure can. So I spent, it was actually 22 and a half years with Domino's, oh. although, although that was over a 31-year period of time. I joined and left the company four different times over my career. Oh. which uh, you and I might not have even spoken about that, but I went on to do other things as well and then came back to the company. And for some reason, it you probably heard my dog just shake in the background. It's okay. <laughs> for, for some reason, I, I kept going back. And, and I can tell you what that, some of those reasons, you know, my personality, my internally, I have a clock that's often almost 95% of the time shifted forward from a normal person's uh, rhythm. So an average business person might be up at six in the morning or seven in the morning and be at work at eight or nine. Right. And, and I got up at 11 and I was at work at one or two and I would work until two o'clock in the morning at Domino's often. That shifted a lot. When I got into business development, I did more morning items and was able to get to bed earlier at night. And by the way, the secret to getting up early is getting to bed early. That is the secret. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you're obligated to be in a store or around a cruise in a store until late at night, it's very difficult to get up out of the morning, uh, out of bed in the morning. Sure. And so in my time at Domino's, I, I really, I worked almost every single specific position except for pizza maker. I was never considered a pizza maker. I was a driver. I was an assistant manager. I was a I was a general manager, I was a district manager, I was an area supervisor, all of these areas uh, in management of multiple stores. And the one thing that Domino's had that uh, many other companies didn't prioritize like, like Domino's does is speed of service. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go into a restaurant, everybody thinks we gotta get these people their food and we have to get it to them in a timely manner. Sure. Well. When I began with Domino's, we had a 30 minute guarantee. So if you did not get your pizza to your door after you ordered it in 30 minutes or less, it was $3 off when I joined. Just a short time before I joined, the pizza was free. Ooh. So there was a very significant incentive for Domino's to create systems that allowed them to make a pizza, bake a pizza, box it, cut it, get it to a driver and be on the road in a very, very fast manner Definitely. so that the driver had the opportunity to get that pizza to the customer without right. driving 90 miles an hour. Right. Right. I mean, the old, the old idea of a pizza delivery driver going around corners on two wheels, and that was not Domino's program at any level. In fact, I remember as a driver, I went through eight weeks of eight hours of training as a driver. Wow. About how to deliver pizzas safely. It was a massive amount of investment from the company. Definitely. And wow. So when you're talking about making a pizza in a minute, getting it in an oven, having a bake off in six or seven minutes, 
boxing cutting onto the warmer, spin it around, run up, get it out the door, you put it into a bag. One of the things that Domino's did was they ran, the drivers ran from the warming unit to their car. They would drive to the customer's house. They would run from their car to the customer's door, run back, drive back to the store, then run from the car to the store. And it was called hustling. Yeah. With a capital that, H. Exactly. So, and we would race each other on our feet. So if two drivers pulled up to a store and I started as a driver in 1991, okay. two drivers pulled up to a store, parking space over here, parking space over here, the doors in the middle, we would jump out of our cars and race each other to that door. And it was so competitive that we would also shoulder each other out of the way Ooh, okay. to get into the store first, you'd get the next run up, right? Okay. So the first person in the store was the first, first driver up. And from the very beginning of my career with Domino's to the very ending of my career with Domino's, everything we did was about how to produce a pizza efficiently and quickly and provide a customer with the best value service that we could. Because people don't order food when they think they're going to be hungry in an hour. They order food when they're hungry. Exactly. So they want to order and eat right now. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, I I just had all these visions of you and somebody else going to that door and trying to get through. <laughs> like, oh, my God. I had one driver basically hip check me into a wall and I crashed down to the floor and he went wow. out and got the next delivery. Oh, well, we were, we were competitive. I, I it's can't. a workman's cop nightmare. And this, in, I bet. In yeah. I was going to say, how did that all work out? <laughs> <laughs> oh my well, this God. This was the nineties wild west. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. So um, your focus on improving people's readiness, you touched a little bit on that and business processes is crucial in the restaurant industry. Um, what are some common challenges you see operators facing um, other than the workers comp hip, you know, throwing people down <laughs> trying to get to what they're doing? Right. Um, how do you help them overcome these obstacles? You know, one of the biggest things is these the places in which they have their employees working in a, in a store so mm -hmm. or in a restaurant. So too many steps. So if you imagine that 10,000 steps is the goal for a day, right, and a a server who's serving food to a guest in a dining room might have 25,000 steps in a day. That's a big difference. And you're talking about that 25,000 steps, almost 100% of it being done over an eight or a nine hour period of time. Sure. They're moving. Yes, they are. And when you, when you break down how far they're actually walking, well, I'm talking about nine, 10 miles. It's not oh, a exactly. short distance. Right. Right. And so if you can eliminate several hundred to a few thousand steps a day, well, at the end of a shift, an employee is going to be fresher. They're going to be able to tolerate uh, emotional imbalances better. They'll be able to tolerate customers who are challenging better. They'll have more energy to do cleanup. All of these things improve when you take steps out of their day because Although we want to move and it's really natural for us to move, sure. we don't want to move at a rate of five or six times the normal average everyday person in order to get a job done in eight hours. Right. That, that wears people helps. out. Right. And then that also helps to avoid burnout, right? I mean, that's got to take, you know, that well, off of there as much as possible. Especially in the last four years. When right. you consider what's happened since COVID. Mm -hmm. It's been such a roller coaster ride. Right. People are tired when they go to work yes. and they're much more tired when they leave work. And sometimes because of family responsibilities or whatever's going on in their personal lives, they can't recover in a day. And so if you can eliminate per day several hundred to a couple of thousand steps just by organizing your kitchen properly certainly, or having a station that a that a line cook can put the food up. 10 steps closer to where the server is going to take it to the dining room uh, as a possibility so that you're balancing out uh, some of what happens in the restaurant. Certainly. The efficiencies can have a compounding effect over time. Certainly. What you said about burnout is, is, is very relevant today because restaurants are typically and have been for the last four years understaffed. Right. When COVID hit, I, I could speak only 
specifically to the uh, percentages of our teams at Domino's, but I know that the same effect happened in other restaurants. We lost 40% of our crews within a 60 day period of time. Wow. And almost all of those people did not come back to the restaurant industry. And the reason for that was they were afraid to be around strangers. There was a lot of question mark as to whether it was a healthy environment to be in. Sure. They had government money that was put up for them to just stay at home instead of going to work. And much, much of the time, the government money was more than they would make when they went to a work place for 40 hours. Yeah. So they were incentivized not to show up financially. And many of them didn't. Uh, and they decided to move on and do other things. So all of the business that happened in that restaurant or that pizza shop, and oftentimes business increased as soon as they were allowed to open again, it was left on 60% of the people that were there previously. Yeah. A lot more work. Definitely. And tell me about your experience going out to restaurants in the last two years. Have you noticed staffing being where it should be, or is it lower than it should be? It's definitely lower. And ironically, I don't remember where I was. I know I was traveling. I was on the road going someplace. And um, I pulled into a restaurant, you know, just to grab some lunch and to take a break from the driving, right? And um, they actually had a sign. Now, this is not verbatim, but it caught my attention. And the sign said that... Um, we apologize for being short staffed. If you're in a hurry, we are taking applications. It's a perfect sign. You know. And many, as, as much as all of us have went through the same experience in general with sure. COVID. Yep. And I hate to be I really dislike four years later, we're still talking about COVID, but it isn't, it absolutely comes to bear on industry and business in general because it changed the world. It did. And it really, really changed the restaurant industry. Absolutely. Whereas you might apply to a restaurant fully staffed. People are making back in 2019, 20 bucks an hour was a great wage as a server. Today, they're making closer to 30. Um, of course, inflation has devalued the dollar. So the $30 right. is probably much closer to the $20 mark it was four years ago. Right. Uh, the reality is that when you had full staffed restaurants and it was a, an employer of choice and there was a waiting list of people to get in, that is almost never the case today. No, you're um, right. Absolutely. That's definitely not the norm today. That's for sure. That's that's definitely for sure. And we find it in service. Yes, exactly. Uh, one, one person can only produce so much in a right. business. Exactly. Exactly. So let's shift to your radio show for a minute, shall we? Sure. Um, the John Adams Show. The John Adams Show has actually garnered quite a following. How do you balance your time between being a consultant and a radio show host? And what really inspired you to start the show? It was, uh, it was, it was a very fast turnaround to go from not having it on my radar at all to now I'm a host of a show. Okay. And our friend Lee Frisbee of Frisbee's Landscaping Patios. I'm sorry, Landscaping. Uh, pools and patios I said hey I'd like you to be a guest on my show would you be open to that I said absolutely tell me when I'm showing up tell me where I'm going to be and uh, let's get it done and so we did that and after the show he said you know the radio station is looking for hosts for for shows and I said oh really tell me more about it and he said a couple of things the following week we met for breakfast and over breakfast we talked a little bit about it and uh, he got me in contact with station management, and I was literally on the radio show the week after that. Oh, wow. That happened really <laughs> fast. You weren't kidding. Oh, wow. it was fast. Yeah, it was fast. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah. Um, wow. That makes my so the, head spin a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> the balance question you asked about how do I do that, it, it, it's only once a week. Okay. So it's 11 to 1 on Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. And... The setup is more than 11 to 1 on Wednesdays. I have to arrange guests. I have to make phone okay. calls, send emails, have conversations, tell people what the experience is going to be like. And if I send out five emails, I might have three people that are interested. And out of the three people that are interested, maybe one of them is available. And then we are in conversation about what date we okay. can have them on the show. Sure. So like I, tomorrow I have a show. 
and 11 to 1. And I had a guest scheduled. Well, it canceled on me last night. Mm. So now today I play scrambled the scramble game. Yep. Try to find a guest for the show for tomorrow. Well, that's good. not an ideal situation. You know, I've had it so that I was booked out five weeks at a time. Right. And that's wonderful. It's yeah. But it's like it's the roller coaster of life, right? Sometimes you sometimes you have to react to things in, instead of instead of planning ahead. Exactly. Exactly. Welcome to the life of an entrepreneur, right? Um, <laughs> I know. Absolutely. Um, but there's no doubt in my mind that you will find someone to fill that seat. Thank you. I appreciate that vote of confidence. <laughs> I, I, I know you, you'll do it. Um, so on to our last one, last question here. So you've worked with many teams and leaders throughout your career. Can mm -hmm. you share a success story where your consulting efforts led to significant improvements in things as uh, business performance and employee satisfaction? What comes to mind right away is... Uh, I have a friend who has a farm mm -hmm. and out of the farm, he produces, he has a little shack. And, and when I say shack, I mean shack. It's probably smaller than your living room. Oh, wow. Okay. And he produces many types of goods out of this little shack. He and his wife and a, their daughter and two employees, and they bake bread, they bake pies, they bake cookies, they, they bake turnovers. And they have several outlets in their community in which they sell these items through. And some people pick up at the farm. Okay. Well, he asked me to, it's down near Angelica in New York state. So he asked me to come by it's an hour and a half or so from my home. He says, can you come down to the farm, have a look at our space and show me a way that as a group of five people in this little tiny workspace that we can actually work together, get more done in the same period of time. I said, absolutely. And so I'm in this little space. It On one side is an oven. On another side is a sink. Next to that is a prep table. On every shelf available, they have their ingredient list for the different things. And I, and I said, okay, where, where are you guys knocking into each other most of the time here? Because they all have to cross back and forth through this right. little tiny space. Sure. And Sometimes they're bumping into each other. Sometimes they do that carrying 40 pound mixing bowls filled with dough that they're going to produce bread with, you know, so it can be dangerous in the mm -hmm. sense that if that falls on somebody's foot, they're going to get hurt or if they twist, they can hurt their back. Sure. Thankfully, they haven't had anything like that, but they're bumping into each other over and over again. I said, okay, let's start with workstations. Somebody's producing a loaf of bread here. And somebody's producing a pie there. Where, wh what is the rub? What, what is causing you, you to bump into each other? And the answer was they use the same, some of the same spices and ingredients for each item. Okay. One of them's over there. One of them's over here. And so this person producing pies has to come over next to the person producing bread. And the person producing bread has to go over next to the person producing pies. And I said, okay, you'll, you have one. One item to use in both stations? Yes. How much does it cost? The answer is $2 or $3. It's really low. Right. Why don't you buy a second one and put it over here? That way, each person stays in their station and they're not crossing the room and bumping into each other. They can just stay right there and continue making the food. That one, they'll reduce steps. Two, it's going to be faster. Three, they're not going to be bumping into each other. And everything they needed to produce the food is right in front of them. Right. And it's a minimal investment to do that. And of course, the eyes. Oh, oh yeah, that's it's great brilliant. Idea. Yeah. But it's not, it's not really brilliant. It's just really considering a workstation and what somebody has to do at their station to get their job done. Right. But I would you agree that if you're in the thick of it, like they are, right? It's kind mm -hmm. of like I can't see the trees. You know, I can't see the forest through the trees, right? right. So yes. when you're in it to them it was when you suggested that it was like a brilliant light bulb moment like oh why didn't we think of that right yes another so, another yeah. story yeah. same same place same person same mm -hmm. business owner and they were talking about having one oven uh no my apologies not one oven one mixing bowl for the bread 
and they shared the mixing bowl for the pies and they shared the mixing bowl to make turnovers. And this mixing bowl was really the, the fulcrum of the whole operation. Sure. It was also the pinch point, right? Because if somebody is making bread with the mixing bowls, you can't make pie filling. Right. Somebody is making pie filling, you couldn't make the turnover dough. So I said, okay, let's take a, how much, how much, how many uh, turnovers does your oven hold? And the answer was like 48. Okay. How much do you sell each, each turnover for? And the answer is $3 each. Okay. So you're looking at about $150 in sales from one batch of turnover. Yes, that's correct. Okay. How much does a mixing bowl cost? 50 bucks. Why don't you buy four of them? Because literally after two weeks, you've paid for your mixing bowls. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And you don't have the pinch point anymore because they can both be producing the, the dough at the same time. If it happens to be that two of them are never used, is it a waste of $100? Yeah, I guess you could call it that. But you know that you're never going to have that pinch point to where somebody's using the mixing bowl and you're not able to go forward. So now you have an employee that you're paying a wage to yep. standing and waiting or looking for something to do, which is always inefficient. Exactly. Right. Yep. And so you have four mixing bowls. They fit right under the oven. So all somebody has to do is say, okay, I'm making pie filling. I've, I've gotten the point. I need to use the mixing bowl, grab the mixing bowl, put it in there, put it in, in the mixing bowl, mix it up, throw it on the mixer. Now you're, you're on to making pies the person who was using their mixing bowl, making uh, the bread dough, right. they can now be putting that into pans and going into the oven. And so the stoppages don't happen. You just keep going. And absolutely. it's for a really limited cost. Yeah, it's a, it, it's absolutely, yeah. It's absolutely phenomenal how you can just simplify it down and just make it so incredibly efficient without breaking the bank. That's right. And you know, sometimes- that- you, you talked about seeing the forest for the trees when people think about buying small wares for their, for their operation, which is the little, little containers that you would use to hold ingredients and, and sure. prepared products. When they talk about buying small wares, that is a cost, right? Yeah. So you have to pay $15 for this. You have to pay $25 for this. And it's right here, top of mind. But if you have an employee making $15 an hour and over the course of their day, they stand around for one hour, right? it's $15. It's right. the same cost. It's, it money is. comes from the same place. Exactly. Exactly. No, that, that's, um, that's really great perspective and a really great way to solidify, you know, how that improvement, that enhancement, if you will, again, it doesn't break the bank. You have to think about it kind of like surround sound, right? We have to think about all the elements and then how to best make them work and be able to work together again. That's right. You know, as you had shared. The other part of that conversation is that when you buy a thing like a smallware, a container that you're going to put an ingredient in, that's a physical item that you hold. You know it costs money. Right. Whereas an employee standing around for an hour, it could be two minutes here, four minutes there. That's not necessarily something you see right away. Sure. But if you invest the twenty dollars in this piece of smallware, yep, and that person doesn't stand around tomorrow for an hour, that's a fifteen dollars savings. And then the following day, they're not standing around for an hour. That's another fifteen dollars savings. Right. That smallware is already paid for, even on day two. If that if that's the piece that's the the pinch point. Exactly, and that goes back to what you shared about the compound effect, right? Um, that's right. It definitely goes back to that. So. Well, John, thank you so much for sharing your insights and experiences with us today. You know, it's been You're a welcome. pleasure learning from you and hearing about your journey. For our viewers who are eager to connect with John and continue the conversation, his contact information is available in the description of this video below. Don't miss out on the opportunity to elevate your business and team with John's expert guidance. Until next time, folks, keep building these genuine connections or those genuine connections, and supporting each other's success. See you in the next episode of Hanging Out for a Living. Bye for now. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks. Bye-bye.